Hi, uh, I'm Holly Pedersen with the Swiss Education Center out of the University of Kansas. And I'm joining you from Salt Lake City, Utah with my colleague, Amy Jablonski. And uh, we're super excited to talk about how we can build better equity-based MTS systems. Amy? Yeah, so I'm Amy Jablonski. I'm coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, Holly and I are just excited to do this work with you. And, um, you know, in this work, we're all in this together. So we just have some bits of questions and thoughts I'd like to share with you today. And as we go into that, Holly, I just want to let folks know, one, of course, we welcome you and are excited that you're here with us. But also from the Swift Education Center, this is really the stance that we believe in. And Holly, I'm going to ask in a minute if you can share another statement that we have after the murdering of George Floyd, where the center stands. But this is really what we believe. And so you'll see throughout this work that we're doing with you and, and having some time with you that you'll see this message um, and the following one throughout our theme that's there. But this is our belief from the Education Center. And then Holly, will you take us and talk about what we came out with recently from the center and after the murdering of George Floyd? Yeah, so the Swift Education Center with the University of Kansas has long been an advocate and a strong voice for inclusive schools and for a focus on students getting their needs met. Um, when the murder of George Floyd occurred, and that was also when the global pandemic was exposing inequities across our country in a lot of different ways, we as a center really took it as an opportunity to think about what we believe in and think about what the next steps needed to be for America's schools. So we committed to, um, to not being quiet and to putting action behind our words so that we could help dismantle the inequitable systems that have been operating in education for a very long time, specifically for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So we know that those systems are harmful. And just as we have historically been a strong voice for inclusive settings in general, we're also going to make sure that our equity-based MTSS discussions include race because it is something that America needs to tackle and needs to have conversations about. these domains and features, right? Everybody has to have a tagline, Swift, we have domains and features. And mm -hmm. when we think about what this presentation is about, is building an equitable and just future for our students, really through what's called an equity-based multi-tiered system of support. Mm -hmm. You know, Holly, when I think about the iconic middle piece of this domain and features, mm -hmm. this is where people tend to gravitate to, like the most tangible thing. If we build a continuum of supports, things will be quote, okay. But as you were pointing out before, the piece of this that's been missing is that conversation about how do we build an equity-based multi-tiered system of support. And so though we're not gonna be talking about the other domains and features, um, idea of a multi-tiered system of support can only happen if we have the others in place. So that's work that we also do across the nation. But let's talk today about really what our time together is gonna be about. So Holly, can you kind of set us up on this, you know, thought of an agenda that you and I put together for today? Yeah. So as you mentioned with the SWIFT domains and features, we're really focused on multi-tiered systems of support and a real strong emphasis on equity, meaning that inclusion is not enough. We need students to be included to the point that they are having outcomes that are not predictable based upon whatever marginalized category they've been put in historically. Um, in our time together, what we wanna talk about is who are, who's in our schools and who's supporting our schools. Um, what, what do our schools need to become and how are we gonna get there? Like, what is the future? How can we create a system of support that supports all students and has an emphasis on those historically marginalized groups of students. So when we talk about equity-based MTSS, it's looking at equity as a way for us to build an inclusive system. 
So what I'm hearing you say is that we have to kind of take a, just a tiny step back first and ground some perspectives and recognizing again that our education system was never built for all students to succeed. I mean, right, we can think about over time how so many groups just had to fight to be part of the system, but on its very onset and inception and beginning, it was this idea of creating systems and continuing systems of power, privilege, and oppression mm -hmm. to ensure that some students and groups people succeeded while a large population of people and various groups were marginalized over time. Definitely. And while um, I don't know an educator today that goes into the field thinking, you know, I want to continue what's always been done. I that's a good point. We don't know those people. That we is don't. true. <laughs> we educators become educators because they want to make a difference and they want to see the world yeah. as a better place. But what we've learned over time is that we have to acknowledge the history and we have to acknowledge how those systems were built if we're going to have a fighting chance to make those systems what they can be. Yeah, and I think when I look in the second bullet, this deficit thinking, right? A lot of times schooling has been, how can we fix students? Mm -hmm. And so I just want to kind of take a pause and say, our job is not fix students. It's about creating an equitable environment and removing barriers so they can be successful. Mm -hmm. And that takes some work and that's work that we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. because we want to take this as an opportunity, right? Schools and what school looks like right now has taken a pause, it's had to pivot for many reasons that we'll go into briefly, but using this as an opportunity to challenge ourselves to actually think about what would an equitable education system look like for students, especially those who have been most marginalized. Definitely, and I mean, you and I both have long histories working in various roles in K-12 education, and we know that it's so rare to actually get time to stop and take a breath. I feel like I just took a breath right now. Just like, yeah. oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting that right now everybody's got their feet up and they're taking a breath because I know that um, the work that is being done to support students during this global pandemic is grueling work. But I think what we're suggesting is it's different work. And let's take an opportunity to acknowledge that things have changed and we have an opportunity to drive the next steps. Yeah, and this piece here is that, you know, whenever, you know, anybody experienced this pivot and change with, you know, intersectional mm -hmm. pandemics, mm -hmm. we also, as you're saying, just can't expect everybody to come back in the same way. And I wanna just kind of ground us for a second that we're talking about intersectional pandemics happening at the mm -hmm. same time. And we're not gonna tease out each of these, but we can wanna definitely acknowledge that, yes, we're talking about a current pandemic around health, about racial justice, economics, and we can layer in more as well. We want to make sure that we do not to, we have many things occurring mm -hmm. now. So now we have this opportunity, as you're saying, to ask some really hard questions. Right. And, and with the intersectional pandemics, it's everything, you know, things that have been suppressed for a really long time are now visible. So we can see them and we can see them clearly, which gives us an opportunity to have that discussion on a larger scale. So when we think about asking hard questions, um, which I know you and I both love to do, right? I think that two of our teammates, they uh, enjoy giving us some of the most wicked problems they could find because they know that you and I love digging into the hard stuff. Yeah. Um, but let's get a little bit of common language because we've been talking about these four letters, MTSS, and we know in education, we love to acronymize everything. I just made that a verb, right? We like to take everything and put an acronym to it. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack a little bit what we mean by MTSS. So if you think about this piece here, mm -hmm. if I talk about here and then let you talk about the equity-based piece, just to get some common language, really want folks to know that we're talking about this idea of what if we could make and have a system in place that would allow for us to have each and every student have their needs met when they needed it. I think that's that next piece of that system of support. You know, we have a lot of resources in schools and I know that we have places that don't have a lot of resources, but whatever resources we have within the multi-tiered system of support, we're trying to talk about how can we organize it so that way folks can thrive in a way that doesn't unintentionally 
cause more harm, but instead elevate the experiences for students. Definitely. And as we as we look at MTSS and the systems of support from an equity lens, especially at this time, it's an opportunity to really elevate the strengths. And what we mean by that is historically um, we've we've had a deficit mindset when it comes to schools. I don't know anyone who likes being called at risk and thinks that that is a a great title for who they are and what they can be and what they will become. So we've learned that we really need to find the strengths that every individual and every community has and use those to address the concerns that we're seeing. And I think the thing that's most exciting for me is that we have an opportunity to flex our muscles collectively so that we create a future where the marginalized nature of students does not predict what their outcomes will be in life, where we really have an opportunity for all students to truly have lives that are valuable to them and that um, are contributory to the good of all of us. So as we think about that, another piece to the equity-based nature of MTSS is making sure that we have these pieces in place I'm that allow us to yep. ask some really good questions, right? So, you know, we have to have the stamina to, to move forward, but also when we kind of tease it apart, we really want to take a look at and asking ourselves, do we have a system in place where students aren't just like, hey, you're here, but that everybody, which means our staff, our parents and all that are welcomed, understood and given a space. And this is a keyword of belonging. Yeah. Like I belong here and I have access to components that are there. And I'm understood, right? I'm, I'm valued for who yeah. I am. And I, I am part of this community in a meaningful way. Um, I think another big piece is looking at not only the system of learning and who has access and who doesn't, but also what our policies, practices, and protocols reveal about the students and their support. So who is marginalized and who benefits? who gets the resources and gets the resources of their own choosing versus who um, you know, is given resources based upon what someone else or another community believes they need. And you, so both you and I have worked again, like you said, in many different roles within a public education sphere. And we all, you know, we've had to make decisions mm -hmm. to implement something, right? Or anything or how to use resources. What I like about what you're saying is that thinking about putting this question at the forefront for each decision we make, because somebody's going to, groups going to be marginalized, groups going to benefit. That's going to be mm -hmm. the truth. But what will we do to mitigate that so that way we're putting safeguards in place so that gap isn't there? And I think putting that at the forefront and also what you're saying about people being understood, we first need to understand who's in our building, right? Like, who well, and I building? think um, the quote at the bottom of this slide right here, where she's talking about schools that work for all groups of students all the time. One of the things that I would like to see um, decimated, we no longer do in schools, is statements like this. Well, it's better than nothing. Or that's just a way to do something. We don't, we have an opportunity to move beyond that and to move to where value is really something that all students get from their educational experience. And part of that comes from who's in the buildings and who's delivering the support to students. So let's just talk about that for a minute because a lot of people want to know, they just want to like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'll just do it, I promise. And it's we have to take a step back and go, well, who are we talking about influencing by doing something? And I'm just using that broadly. So uh, how about I talk about our, the adults we have in our building and maybe then you bring it into our students. Let's talk about this. And as we say all of our adults, and I think you're gonna might push back on me in a second when I say all of us mm -hmm. adults, but just think about, you know, in an education building, we typically have, this slide has like three different, you know, if you will say generations, which we know are kind of soft in the beginning of, you know, age brackets and kind of just some, iconic moments of time that we can say we, we have in place. We say that these are the adults in the building who are creating the systems for students to experience. 
And so um, and I think, you know, one day you and I realized that um, maybe we're not so different in, in where we fall in this continuum, uh, that we actually fall in a very similar place. But let's put this up against our students. So if this is what our, our us as adults have experienced, we're building a system for these kiddos to um, experience, what do we see? Yeah, so I think one point that I'd like to to make going into this our students is that those three groups, even though it's soft and the edges may not be really distinct, they've all had a different experience with society and with yeah. the way that schooling interacted with them. And so we have adults in the building who are coming from different vantage points, but all being subjected to today's global pandemic and the other systemic racism and the um, you know police brutality and all of the things that are coming at us right now. But then we're working with students who come from a very different lens. They come from a lens where technology has always been at the table and where, you know, knowledge was easy to acquire. You didn't have to wonder, or go to the library or go to the, an expert to get your question answered. You can just look up on YouTube and there's probably a how to video to do it. Um, our current students, they've experienced violence in their schools or the threat of violence. They've oftentimes, um, had intense stress regarding the national news. And they spent a lot of time taking standardized tests and preparing to be tested as individuals. Their world is different than what you and I and what the other groups of adults in the building have experienced. And so what does that mean? Well, let's leverage those strengths of that generation. So Amy, you know, I have two kids. I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, and they're both part of this Generation Z. And they're different. I'm just going to say it. They are different. And they're different in some really promising ways. They, they want diversity in their experiences. They value mm -hmm. data. They value evidence. They don't think, take things at face value. They're entrepreneurial. They're willing to be innovative and try new things and step out of their comfort zone. And because they've had screens and technology from birth, Human interaction is premium for them. They want it and they want it very, very much so. So with the strengths of Generation Z, if you'll humor me, my daughter is in the fourth grade and she came home from school a couple of days ago and she said, mama, our playground is getting redone. And I thought, uh -huh. that's interesting. You know, during a global pandemic, what school system has the resources to redo their playground? Right, I was gonna ask that, but continue. Yeah, but, but what she told me and what was really promising to me is they have a student who uses a wheelchair in their school for the first time in a while. And they recognize that the playground was not accessible for that student. And so they're redoing it. And to see the excitement on her face that a student was going to be able to use the swings that couldn't previously, the inconvenience of having no playground for a few days was nothing to her because yeah. she was so excited about the opportunity to have more people accessing the fun that her school offers. I think that's a strength of Generation Z. They're not exclusionary. They want to have everybody part of the conversation. And I think that, you know, as we go on in this, this chat mm -hmm. today, We'll talk about how to use these strengths within our and how we design our classrooms to ensure that we do have this just type of educational experience. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting, what I'm, I'm, you know, taking from what you're talking about, Holly, is that we have this strength, and we, we talked just briefly about these ideas of our generations, mm -hmm. but now we have to layer on this other piece um, about we're all experiencing collective Ooh. trauma. And can you just kind of chat through for us what we mean by yeah. that? Because collective trauma, trauma. Yeah, so collective it? trauma is not a new term or a new condition. Um, the, okay. the research I've seen on collective trauma comes from uh, survivors of the Holocaust, communities that had, um, you know, what we would call an act of God. They had earthquakes or um, weather changes that affected everybody in the community. And so they have a shared experience of being helpless and disoriented and um, loss together. And so they identify with that. And right now we are in a collective trauma. We are in a pandemic that is affecting all of us. It's affecting us in different ways. But one of the things that I've really noticed that has come out with this collective trauma is the idea of moral injury. And that mm -hmm. is, educators, first responders, parents, people who have responsibility for the 
the care and feeding, the health and well-being of other people, yeah. they're getting hit so hard right now during this collective trauma because they know there are better ways. They know that if conditions were different, they could better support those that they are charged with. You know, they're, if they really are their brothers and sisters keepers, they know what they could do. But the pandemic is limiting our ability to do that. So we're all entering trauma and we're all experiencing it in different ways, but we can't say that there are any members of our community that are not being touched in some way by this collective trauma. So I like how you went through that to ground us in the fact that there is trauma, then there's also this collective trauma. And you might, you talk through this already thinking about, you know, there can be events either, you know, as a one event or a series, and now we're in this collective trauma. Mm -hmm. But what I want to get to in this conversation of trauma is about how we can see some impacts come up. So, and you and I have chatted about this some, but I guess, and you know, sometimes, you know, I wish we were face to face people to get some feedback in a way, but thinking about, we can see, I know for myself, where I'm seeing these four things show up, my, my cognitive, you know, the way my emotions happen to be, my regulation isn't, um, my zone of, you know, tolerance is a little bit smaller than, than what it usually is you know, physically just feeling different and then also the impacts in the social world and yeah, then this is coming right into our classrooms. Um, and also that trauma affects different people in different ways. So we really can't say, oh, well, that wasn't that big of a deal because maybe we had the mental resources of that moment to deal with it. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to be at the same place at any given time. So as we're thinking through all this, and as we're leading up to the, this piece, this opportunity that we're calling, you know, oh man, I just knew saw the same. There's so many different terminologies in there about like return to learn. Yeah. I think it's this idea of like, if we step back away from the idea of this is not just about schooling in its traditional way. And what I really like what, you know, former President Barack Obama was talking about on May 16th was that we have this almost call now mm -hmm. there is no return to normal mm -hmm. and even if we there is there really is no normal in general but um really what does this mean and his call to what this means for our youth and we think about how that intersects with the education mm -hmm. space you know with the disparities being really as you said out in the mm -hmm. open everything's been shaken up things we never thought we could change or could always had to be the same way actually aren't like that thing of we always have to give standardized tests yeah. unless there's a pandemic you know we always have to do this oh, unless there's a pandemic so returning to the old way can't no it happen. can't and, and and really the question is should it um i think one of the great things about this generation of students is that they are willing to question. They're willing to say, oh, why is it that way? And should it be that way? And so I love, I think that what Barack Obama's, you know, comment really does for me is it reminds me that we will be negligent as educators if we go back to exactly how things were pre-trauma because the students want to make things better. And we don't want to disenfranchise them we need them to make this world a better place. So in taking this opportunity, and we do know in, in saying this, that this kind of, you know, butts up against traditional ways of thinking of schooling in general, but we're not going to go fully down that, that path in today's short time that we have together. Right. We really do want folks to chat through and, and take some time. Like what is, what could this time be when we're in this, place of waiting to see what education could look like. And, you know, I, I had a previous supervisor one time told me, she's like, Amy, if you don't come to the table with solutions, they're going to be handed to you. And so I think that call of using this time where we can actually analyze our policies, our practices, our protocols, I'm even going to put traditions in there that marginalize populations of youth and actually sit in the space of you know what have we created as adults that was handed mm -hmm. to us right and that we either then implemented or carried on that actually does uh, marginalize 
is. And we think about this, and I know at the center we at Swift we talk a lot about equity mindedness. Um, we have a whole series on it, and you know how we've been able to take the learnings from the institutions of higher ed and put them into pre-K through 12 practices. But this is really our chance to sit in this space right now. Definitely, and it's also our chance to, like you said, sit in the space, grapple with with ideas, grapple with history and tradition with a different point of view, because we have to, because we're not in the same space we were a year ago. And so it really is, I believe, a call to action. It's an opportunity for us to explore how we how we do the things that we do in schools and if that's the way we want to continue doing them. So today in our limited time, we want to just touch on three things that schools do have some control over. They're not outside of our control. So how do we how do we allocate resources? How do we decide what we spend time on? How do we decide what we spend money on? How do we decide what we do and what we don't do? Environmental supports, how are we structuring the environment in which students will be learning to support? And also, what are we teaching and what materials are we using to do that? Well, before we go into each of these, which we're going to do, is that we want to remind ourselves to that um, this phrase of everybody has to be at the table. We all need a seat at the table. And what we mean by that in this particular context mm -hmm is that a lot of times we've built a system mm -hmm. and then tried to retrofit right. for our most vulnerable students. So what we're asking now, right, is to think about this as actually a system that fits all of our students, but putting the most vulnerable at the center of it to ensure that it is an equitable experience. Yeah, and, and I think of the, everybody at the table, we can't continue to be limited by our perception of space or of who deserves to be at the table. Um, we just need to make room. We need to get a bigger table. So get a bigger table, yeah. yeah. So that we can make sure that the conversations that are most needed are the ones we prioritize. Let's start chatting through this re idea of resource allocation. Um, so we think about resource allocation. Mm -hmm. Um, and we think about this idea of we do have extreme places where resources are limited. Um, highly recognize that. Um, however, when we think about the breadth of where we could pull our resources from, we could pull them also from communities. Um, and so I like this push about thinking about a way that we can respond in a way that their communities need them the most, not just kind of um, who's always- Yeah, and I think an example I have for this that's happening right now in in this communities that my, my students attend school, every student got assigned a um, digital device. What sounds equal, right? Everybody got it, which is great. But the thing is, our house, we have so many digital devices, we did not need another digital device. And how could those resources been allocated in a way that made more sense? That acknowledged that my, my household doesn't need those two Chromebooks. So where do we best put the resources that would have gone to those two Chromebooks so that there's an equitable model out there? So that's definitely about those resource allocations in a way of things that we have tangible. But what if we also talk about a resource that sometimes we forget about? You're talking about and time, what aren't I'm, you? I'm about to talk about time. <laughs> uh, I'm about to talk about time because this is one thing that, you know, as I really began grappling with how to best use resources, I kept thinking about things, the stuff. And then um, Dr. George Batch brought uh, my learning and my grounding to thinking about time. And I was like, we never have enough. He's like, you do, you're just misusing it. He's like, time is your greatest free resource. Free, not meaning in minutes, but in the fact that we're not paying for more time. Meaning that um, it's this thing that we typically don't spend time talking about how we can best utilize it. And I, uh, he talked through this one example that really hit with me that's here um, in this, on the slide, is that if we think about whenever a student begins 
a schooling experience. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter where the type of environment mm -hmm. for that year. It's almost as if their instructional minutes are on like this debit card mm -hmm. and every minute is a potential use of academic engaged time. And there's about 990 and then we're going to just start ticking it off, ticking it off. And mm -hmm. there's no deposits, right? There's not another deposit. It's almost as if like a kid has, X number of minutes for their pre-K through 12 years or however many years they're there. And every year they take some out. But here's the here's the thing, Holly, that I find to be the catcher is I really talk about this. The students don't get to decide how to use their minutes. No. It's the adults. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about that piece and we think about now how can we translate that into like a way of better utilizing it, is this call to this beast of a thing called the math your schedule. Right, which is metaphorically the table. That's the yes. table that people sit at in exactly. In particular, I believe at a secondary school. If you want to know um, what a secondary school values, ask to look at their master schedule. It's going to tell you. It will. And I think it's very very clear to glean into that on the secondary level. I'll say where it becomes quite um, an interesting game of did you ever play Tetris? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like a game of Tetris and I remember building a master schedule and this was, you know, first I did, I did, a, I did multiple building levels, but one I remember really reflecting upon is at an elementary level. Mm -hmm. It was like the prettiest game of Tetris, the colors, like all like things lined up almost like a Rubik's cube and everything fit perfectly in these, these boxes per se. And then later on was challenged about why I made my decisions. And I was like, that's how it yeah. fits. But I was never asked, I never asked myself a couple of things. One, what data did I use to help have informed conversations about how much time is needed in different subject areas? And also this phenomenon about elementary schedules is that there are no transition times. Typically, it's like a magical place in elementary where you can start and stop a subject at the exact same moment mm -hmm. you could be in reading and then the very same minute be in lunch right. like the idea that in elementary we forget to account for those times so we can better amplify them mm -hmm. and i think you know at swift we have an entire segment and practice around the master schedule and resource inventory work to help folks really unpack and what are their values and priorities and build it around maximizing time yeah. which also plays into our environment and you were chatting about this a little bit ago about environment yeah yeah and i think um i want to i want to step back one second back to time and okay. say this right now we are in a time like no other where none of our schools look like they do in a year that isn't influenced by a global pandemic agreed and that that feels hard and it feels um, stressful, but it also is an opportunity for us to reevaluate what time should be. And so I feel like that's, if anybody, if there's one takeaway from our time together, it's take the time to have the conversation, to really decide that what you're doing is intentional and not just what made the Tetris pieces come together. Well, and I want to add to that, I'm gonna stick on time for a second as well, as folks read this quote here. Um, from castle but you know time doesn't mean squishing more in it's about that use of right using it in a very strategic and equitable way mm -hmm. and one thing i would say for each of these call to actions is thinking about it from a student's perspective mm -hmm. right ever chatting with um an elementary teacher oh, maybe like a year ago we were talking about time and master schedule and mm -hmm. it was like what did your kiddo in your first grade class experience and she recognized he had 20 transitions in one day mm -hmm. lost and didn't even make sense mm -hmm. so with time with the master schedule and now let's talk about environmental supports i think part of my challenge to people who are listening is what does this look like from a student's perspective definitely definitely and as we talk about environmental supports I think it's natural to go to the culture and climate, the environment of the school. Yeah. So let's talk about the historic challenges with that, particularly for 
are Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the schools? So let's, I like where you're going. Let's think about it through the lens of the idea of villain. That's a lot where folks go. Mm -hmm. And if we think about that, let's look at Remember back in the beginning of this presentation, Holly, we talked about like that grounding perspective about there's like deficit thinking and thinking we need to fix students. And here's like an example. Um, and this comes from um, our great colleagues through PBIS. Um, let's just let's just look here. And if you follow those arrows, so just point out, I just grabbed a few here. And if we think about a typical student behavior, let's just take bullying behavior, right? Typically, an adult response would be out of school suspension. And then, but yet that outcome creates disproportionality. So if you follow these arrows, just a few of them, what we're hiding, what we're highlighting on the right hand side with the outcomes or what we alluded to in the beginning about exclusionary practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the name of the game here, in a way, is not about how do we create, how do we, it's not about what are we gonna do to fix students or how are we gonna go ahead and fix disproportionality without thinking about a whole nother complete segment of this, which is about our prevention so, strategies, which gets to that. Yes, point. and I also wanna point out when we talk about the pipeline of fixing students, discipline by its very nature is, is a biased system. What I may define as bullying behavior, you may define as a student who is stressed out and needs a break. And so yeah. we are as adults making decisions every day, what will happen next for a student. And we've got to acknowledge that our own lens matters. There's a reason why there's, I mean, there's a lot of talk right now about the adultification of black girls mm -hmm. and how they're expected to be adults, be mini adults and be more prepared and, and to respond differently. And when they don't, they are, they are treated poorly and they become part of this, this pipeline of being fixed. And oftentimes that pipeline of being fixed means they're excluded from opportunities and from next steps. And so whenever we talk about discipline, I mean, I don't want to go back to zero tolerance, but I do want to say this, it is not something that is very clear and you can just check a box because every disciplinary interaction is a human interaction where the adult in the building is making a decision based upon their experiences, their lens, and their beliefs. So let's talk about prevention. <laughs> well, you know, I, I appreciate you spending more time there. I do, because there's a lot that goes into the concept of, of discipline, right? You know, this idea of, you know, I, I was not suspended as a student. I didn't experience that. Um, yet I did suspend students as an administrator. And I guess I can't, I don't know what it feels like to be told you can't come back here in for right, X number of you. days. And then when the student does come back, I mean, even a kindergartner has a reputation. They need to go ahead and salvage with their peers. You know, this is not, we're still operating, as you're saying, in this exclusionary way. You know, that difference between overt and covert. Mm -hmm. Ways that we can go ahead and say, well, our policy says this, so it has to be this. Versus how can we look at the policy differently? Change in that system way to create some different outcomes while we're layering in, and we'll get to that right now, the prevention piece. Right, right. You know, how do we create a place of prevention that allows specifically for our most margin, historically marginalized populations of students to feel safe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to feel that in a sense of engagement mm -hmm. and that there's supports in place that are not about exclusionary practices. How do we put in place things like restorative practices that don't continue to try to control specifically our black boys? How do we allow for voice and emotion 
to be celebrated, not stifled, so it doesn't then lead to these types of exclusionary practices. Right. right. Um, so we have environment pieces, which you and I could spend all day on. We could spend a day on every single one of these slides, <laughs> but we also have curriculum and instruction. Um, kind of what people say, like the bread and butter of what school is quote, supposed to be. It's about teaching, teaching something and teaching in a certain way. Um, but, you know, Lisa Delpit pushes on us here, mm -hmm. um, pushes on us to think about the ways that we can cultivate curriculum in a way to preserve mm -hmm. and sustain cultures. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think about, I mean, there's a quote that by Nikki Giovanni, um, really good thinker who she says it's not about who you go to school with it's about who controls your school and as we look at curriculum and instruction the decisions made about that do control a lot of the elements in the day-to-day -day operations of schools so we have to be making those decisions based upon the culture and the support of the students who are attending the school so when we go back and think about the students who are attending the school and every school has, you know, a different, you know, lived experience within this population, but the broad brushstroke of the strengths of Generation Z, mm -hmm. which you walked through earlier, today, think about what they do for our implementation of equitable support. Um, kind of chat through some of these that stand out to you, Holly, because I know that you spent a lot of time thinking about culturally sustaining practices, right? Different than responsive. And we have some resources at the end that folks can take a look at, but talk through some of these that really stand out to you, maybe even specifically in today's Yeah, sphere. well, I think back to, let's go to the, let's go to the, the elephant in the room, the, the current situation we're in with the global pandemic, with economic challenges, <laughs> with racism and with police brutality. Those are happening in the world of our students. In fact, if you think about, you know, like my daughter is nine, well, one year of her life, that's a, that's a large proportion of her life that has really been focused on this. We yeah. cannot go back to school and not connect to that information and not connect to the historical underpinnings of what is going on. If we fail to do that, we have missed an opportunity to engage students and to create the learners that this world needs to become what we know it can be. So instruction and curriculum has to acknowledge what is happening now and how that connects to the past and how that can lead to the future. So that's just one of the examples that really jumps out of out of me on this list. Another example here that I saw is um, really looking on expanding on options for students. You know, we, we are not hmm. limited to a chalkboard in the classroom and every kid having a slate with a writing utensil. We have a lot of ways that students can express and practice their communication skills. And now is an opportunity to really explore that and make sure that that is prominent in the decisions we're making about instruction and curriculum. Amy, which ones jump out at you? So I think for me, um, really that utilized piece, the variety of languages, and mm -hmm. I'm really pulling on uh, my student teaching experience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Holly, you know this, like I grew up in, mostly in New Jersey, some in Southern California. And then um, I went to undergrad in Charleston, West Virginia, University of Charleston in West Virginia. And my student teaching experience was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, Holly, that was the scariest 15 weeks of my life I because I am not a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing about me that's in kindergarten at all. Right. Um, it was a humbling experience. Um, the scariest part was the fact of that I'm not a kindergarten being. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to learn different dialects. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of my experiences in schooling was, was not uplifting the Appalachia dialect and the richness of culture. Mm -hmm. It wasn't provided to me in a light of strength. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we can have these utilized language styles, utilize not just the formal piece of language use, which none of us use a lot, really. Um, I mean, you and I both had to muster mm -hmm. that up for you know our doctoral <laughs> work yeah. some time. But I'll use it then, you know, it's this informal and valuing these spaces of language 
which values communication, which values word, which values thought and expression of ideas that begin to challenge the rub between how we hold individuals up to listen to their ideas. And I think when we can utilize more of these in the way that we engage with texts and, and strategically pick texts that really value other types of language than a certain community might value, that one really is sticking out to me a lot clearly as we were yeah, talking today. Definitely. And I think along those same lines that engaging the communities in what mm -hmm. they desire and want to sustain through schooling, um, not making assumptions that may or may not be accurate. The, if we can have true engagement in a conversation around a really big table with everybody there helping us plan what we want schools to be in the future, it will be, I, I promise you, it's going to be more effective. It's going to be more rich and inclusive, and we're all going to have a better experience. And I want to point out one more thing here before we begin to wrap this up around this topic is that, you know, how it kind of, it, it really hit me uh, how many years ago, like marginalized populations get a month in the U.S., a month of celebration, right? <laughs> February, Black Lives yes. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you know, March, women's history, you know, um, so I get two months, you know, as a person who identifies as gay. So I also get June and I get, you know, so I get two months. <laughs> but it, I mean, and I'll say this in a way of that that is one thing within curriculum and instruction in the environment of our school to break those down mm -hmm. and realize that this intentionality to build up, and I'm thinking about that first bullet here, cultural mm -hmm. languages throughout the year, every month, using those as opportunities to highlight positive work that's in, in a positive light. I guess is what I'm saying. In a positive light, being able to shine in text and literacy and languages so that way students can see right. themselves. I'll be honest, I can't think of encountering one gay author or piece of literature that I was exposed to as someone identifying as gay throughout school. It was never given to me in a positive light. Um, I could talk about, you know, health class experiences as well. Like there was a little bit of a mismatch for me of what I was learning and what I actually needed to learn. You know, there are these components there that now that we can talk about intersectionality with race at the center of it and how all these pieces come in, giving a space for kids to see who and what they are right. in a positive way. And what life. they can be. Right. I mean, like yeah. the sky's the limit and what, what, what contributions I, I love asking students, not what do you want to be when you grow up, but what problem do you want to solve? Because it really gives me insight into mm -hmm. the world they're coming from and what their motivations are. When I think of problems that you and I like to solve, Holly, it kind of goes around this one right here mm -hmm. is really partnering with folks mm -hmm. in any type of educational mm -hmm. sphere to think about how we can leverage on places in our system to change supports that really are those deep lines of equity mm -hmm. that, that pull into hard questions mm -hmm. and peeling back the onion and saying, no, these things actually can be changed. Yeah. And letting people know we, we, we have, especially through collective organizations and thought partners to, to actually push on these. Mm -hmm. And because they're human created, mm -hmm. they can be human dismantled and reimagined and reestablished. Right. That's the good news. That's that is the good news. Yeah. So, and you know, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world is uh, Barbara Jordan. Uh, and on the topic of curriculum, I would love to see Barbara Jordan included in every conversation related to history and social studies in our country. I'm curious how um, prevalent that experience is for our students. I don't know. From my perspective, I didn't learn about Barbara Jordan until much later in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was mad that I didn't know about Barbara Jordan because now um, I just, I reread her, her speeches and 
I really, um, I feel part of my call to action is, you know, honor her work mm -hmm. and not move it forward. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, you know, my grandmother, as you well know, as a Holocaust survivor, honoring her life and using education as a space to, you know, do what Barbara Jordan is saying here is to our imperative. And we know the work you and I love to do is to define what is right. And then this last piece do it. of empowering right. folks to say, yeah, let's just go ahead and do that. Yeah, let's do that. So that is the message we hope carries from our time together, that yeah. we take this time to have the right conversations, to identify who is in our buildings to serve students and who are we serving? What is it that we want to see the future look like and how are we going to make that happen? And, and it's, you know, taking the time for those conversations isn't something that's going to be easy, but it's what's necessary so that we don't get another system that gets retrofitted to fit the needs of students. We want to start with the needs of students and build from there. That's what equity-based MTSS is. Well, Holly, I've had, as always, a great time chatting with you today. You know, our contact information is here. You can also, um, you know, reach out via Swift Schools um, and, and take a look at some things that we have there. And, you know, a great book by two of our colleagues, um, you know, Anna McCart and Don Miller. But I think, um, you know, Holly, I love that we get to do this work together. And for everyone who's, you know, participating in, you know, this, this session and also in the entire conference, just thank you for being in this work and, and thank you for, for having the call to, to come in and, and chat about what is education now, what could it be? And then also want to leave you with, none of us have the exact answers and collectively we can ask really good questions to drive uh, us as humans to make good decisions. Definitely. And I, I want to echo the appreciation that you extended. I, I think that um, inclusion is where we as an educational community first saw what could be and realized that there was an opportunity to build a system that was different. So I really appreciate the efforts that advocates, families, communities have made to increase the inclusivity of our schools. Well, thanks for your time, everybody.